What is up, everybody? It is Friday, so you know what time it is. This is the Sales on the Rocks podcast, the Friday segment of the Best Damn Agency podcast. I am your host, JJ Russell, and he is Joey Gilkey, my partner in crime. Joey, how are you, man? Uh, we fancy now, though. Check out this background. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, you see what I'm talking about. If you don't, then you better go subscribe to YouTube and go check us out. Massive upgrade. Yeah, kind of. I mean... We have letters. Our design and, skills uh, are a little limited over here since we are a sales <laughs> company, not so much a design company, but... You know, actually, yeah, I got that shit all the time on sales calls. They're like, you're, you know, your sales collateral is great, but it just, it looks terrible. I'm like... 100%. Yeah, but it's, but we're going to make you the monies and yeah. your job's to make stuff look nice. And they still pay us. They still pay us. That's right. Uh, Joey, how was your weekend, man? Um, it was good since we're recording this on a Tuesday and technically you guys are listening to this on a Friday, my weekend passed. Um, I did a lot of chores. I sold my wife's old car. My wife had this car forever and then I bought her a really nice new car and she really wanted to hold on to it because, uh, Joe Biden was becoming president and gas prices we knew were going to go up. (laughs) Sure as shit they did. So, uh... Yeah, it was a it was a super nice economy civic from 2007. Super nice, <laughs> super nice. <laughs> no, we ended up selling it. Is it, blue, is it blue? Do what? Was it the blue one? No, she's got or she had a silver civic from. She bought it in California when she was out there. Is that the then, card that I was in you with when you got pulled over uh, for going the wrong yes. way down a road in in downtown Greenville? It's exactly the car. <laughs> <laughs> Joey completely disregards road signs, but and to your credit, you were trying to help us friends out. It was late night. We'd been out at a bar. You were driving. You were the DD, and you didn't want to make our wives walk down Greenville Main Street in heels at midnight. Because I'm a gentleman and a scholar. That's what I do. Yeah. And then you got pulled over. <sighs> yeah, the cop was a dick, but whatever. It got thrown out because I brought in the big guns. Who was the big, like, like a lawyer? A lawyer. <laughs> okay. From like in the middle of nowhere, South Carolina. Didn't take much. Didn't, Didn't take, take much. much. What, what are you drinking? Uh, I'm back on the single barrel E.H. Taylor. I've already drank this once on, on this podcast, but it's just such a damn good bottle. It's my favorite go-to. So I'm probably going to have this more often than any other one. But yeah, uh, single I, barrel. Uh, I got the same scenario over here. My... Let's see, what was it? My Knob Creek nine year is a, I think I said it was like the first show. I got a 1.75, so it's it's a big it's boy. It's going to last. Yeah, I got to I gotta work on it. Yeah, I also forgot to bring um, I have my collections at home. There are some things behind my head, as you see, if you're watching this, but my collections at home, and I forgot to bring it to the studio today. Speaking of, I'm mm-hmm. probably moving studios, so you guys might see a new setting in the coming months. Where are you headed? Well, I think I'm selling this building. It's served me well, but the market's hot and your daddy's trying you to You gave make... us all the numbers. <laughs> you gave us all the numbers the last, last week. Episode. Yeah. I'm yeah. supposed to make a couple hondo on this one. So figured I might as well do it. And then, uh, but I still need a studio. And um, so I'm probably going to go. A buddy of mine has an e-commerce warehouse and he's got a couple vacant offices that are mm-hmm. shitty, but perfect for a studio because you can do whatever you want in there. And they're quiet. So, That's great. That's all you I'll need, man. Some, Bare bones. Trip them yeah. out. I'm thinking yeah. I might do like I might get a graffiti artist and come do some cool like background stuff and maybe do like a like a neon sign of some sort. I don't know. Maybe Dude, really to sign. recreate your current background, all you need is some black paint and a couple of shelves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not too complicated, and it's all about the lighting. So that'll come with me. Well, what's funny about the pictures behind me? We grabbed them from like a. We're, we're my wife's infamous for like secondhand shopping it's like her it's her hobby she loves it yeah so if there is an estate sale or a yard sale or a neighborhood sale she's gonna be there there. and i feel like she probably ends up spending more in total than she would if she just like went to a regular retail store and bought the thing one time but we just end up buying lots of stuff so this i've got two paintings behind me i don't know if you can see them they're actually the same painting just one's flipped upside down yeah (laughs) so yep that's yeah, how we did it. Classy, dude. I like it. <laughs> oh yeah, you know it. That's creative. 
I'm a fan. You're yeah. uh, this this upcoming weekend, man. You're going on an adventure, right? Man. You're gonna go shoot some guns and take some, some Polaris and out. Do some other man stuff. Yeah, we're gonna take out a couple twenty thousand dollar machines and probably break them. So these are uh, we're taking out Polaris razors. There's this uh, place in North Tennessee where I live, East Tennessee, Northeast Tennessee, called uh, Royal Blue, which is like 600 miles of redneck paradise. So that's where we're going. We're going to go camp out in a couple RVs, bring up six or seven machines, and uh, go buck wild. It's supposed to rain too, so it's going to be a mud a mud pit as well. So that's going to be – it's a dream. Is this a – an appropriate time to bring moonshine. I feel like if you're going to Redneck Paradise, moonshine is almost yeah. mandatory. You know, I'm not a huge moonshine. There's a there's a really good moonshine. They're actually a client of mine back in the long, long, long time ago. But they're uh, Smoky Mountain moonshine. They have yeah, all these unique flavors. Um, I'm not a big moonshine guy, but it probably would be the the appropriate setting to probably <laughs> light up some some dirt sticks and. Smoke some or drink some moonshine. So. <laughs> not, I don't. Smoke well, you enjoy that, but I don't smoke cigarettes. But that might be when I would do it. Yeah, if you were, if you were going to smoke a cigarette, For that sure. would be the time. You get your Facebook back. Well, yet? let's. Oh no, sorry. That's a great. We need to jump into that real quick. So, if you're a Facebook hacker, you're a dick. Like, totally. let's just be. <laughs> let's be honest. Like, why? <laughs> I on I don't know if I mean I'm sure they could steal some of my information and some of it's valuable in some way. But uh, honestly it can't be that valuable man. Like and I'm maybe I'm an easy target because I haven't been active on Facebook for like 6 years. Right. But I just don't want somebody stealing my shit. Like that's just on principle. Also, if you're Facebook customer support, you're scum of the earth cuz you suck. suck. You suck. There is no way to call them, email them, write them an angry text message. <laughs> they just give you a list of recommendations. Good thing and, we have really smart, yeah. world-class Facebook ads agencies who have one-on-one support that might help yeah. you get it back. I love you, Jason Smith. You're a good man. <laughs> You're a good man. We're going to work on it tomorrow. So I will, I'll will. i give you an update tomorrow whether or not I get my Facebook back officially. Again, I don't really care I just don't like the fact that somebody stole my stuff on principle. So well, I'm sure the the fans will be waiting with anticipation to know if you got them back. So yeah, we're we're definitely going to get some fan mail about this. <laughs> Let's talk sales. Speaking Let's of the listener, plug and do it. Let's do it. So we have not talked about this topic here on the show. All right, because some might consider it archaic. We've talked okay. about, you know, we've talked about email. Is email dead? Uh, the answer is no. If it's only dead if you suck at it. Yep. And obviously, there's lots of other channels to reach your buyer, potential buyer on. But I want to talk about cold calling. Yeah. And let's just let's start with: Can cold calling still work? And I'm sure that it works better for people who are going after certain verticals. Sure. Uh, but can it work? And who does it work best for? Uh, answer is yes. Um, every mm. tactic can work. So that's. That's the learning lesson of all this is any tactic and every tactic can work, right? And so I think that's where people get, they're always looking for the silver bullets and yes, some work better than others in certain contexts, but I think that's the biggest thing is like, it entirely depends on your context. And so um, I would argue that cold calling works in every circumstance. Only time it might be more challenging is if you're, overseas and you're trying to call into the US or something of that nature. There sure. might be some logistical issues there, but that's logistics. But from a tactical perspective, it works. Because at the end of the day, as we've talked about, sales comes down to can you build trust? And there is a shitty way of doing cold calling and there is a, a more methodical way. So I think that's the biggest thing Let's is... Let's talk about the shitty way. Let's talk about uh, yeah. what is the shitty way to do cold calling? Um, well, I think that... Uh, Cold calling is a bit more of a numbers game just because just like email, email, email is also a quality game, but it's also quantity too. Um, I know I, the quantity that I have to send in order to get the positive responses I want and therefore meetings I want. So that is a quantity game. It's a much less quantity than say a cold call, but typical cold call, it comes down to a few things. One, 
is your connect rate. What is your your likelihood of connecting um, with the decision maker you want to get in front of? Because yeah, because you just hit gatekeepers all day long, or an, you, or gatekeepers, phone trees, busy tone, whatever, yeah, voicemails, all that whole gamut. Um, so you have a, you have connect rate, and then you have conversation rate, and then you have you know conversion rate, right? So okay. it, it's a little bit different there. So connect rate is can I talk to them? Conversion is do they let me actually pitch them and, and have a conversation with them? And then uh, conversion is will they take the next step, the the first meeting kind of thing? And so it's it's definitely a numbers game. There is an art to it, but like anything, it comes down to your messaging and your value prop and what do you bring to the table. And can yeah. you cut through the noise of everybody else cold calling? I think for a yeah. lot of folks, like agencies specifically, like there are very few digital agencies picking up the phone. So if you decide to be an agency who wants to master the phone, you're probably swimming in, in a, a little bit clearer waters than people who are learning how to cold call and use LinkedIn automation. Sure. Or excuse me, cold email and LinkedIn automation. Email, yeah. So yep. that's that's a, an answer. I don't know if it answers your full question. No, that's great. I, and I, you know, to take it the next uh, the next step, I think you said there's a shitty way to cold call. Um, I've heard you talk about a really effective way to cold call. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody was going to undertake this endeavor to try to swim in some clearer waters and see if they can, I mean, try it out. Like you said, give it a give it a test run, yep. get some data behind you, see if you're getting those connections and if uh, people are taking to it well. But what's your strategy for cold calling? Because I know that you don't try, like you're not trying to call, get somebody and pitch them on that call. Yeah. That first I mean, call. literally I'm trying to get 20 to 30 seconds of attention and I'm trying to be respectful of their time and let them know that. And I'm trying to get them into a first time appointment that we get on the calendar. Cause right. There's no way you're going to be able to pitch them on a call and have a full blown first time appointment. And they're not, in, they're not in a buying like mode, right? They're in doing something else. You interrupted them. That is the other hard part about cold call versus everything else is LinkedIn messages. They have to physically go in and check their messages. Email, they have to go in and physically check their email. Cold call, you're you're hitting them up and they're just pick up the phone. It could be someone internally, it could be externally, but there's no transparency unless they have some sure. sort of call ID thing, right? And so the odds there of you catching them in a buying decision or a buying mode is pretty slim. So your goal is not to convert them on on a solution. It is to agitate the problem and 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 get them hooked into setting a time when they will be in more of a buying behavior. And so yeah. your goal should be to, and I call it just hook setting, like you are supposed to set a hook. The first five seconds, seven seconds, get their attention. Once you get that, you pull them a little bit closer, you throw the next hook out there. You got 20 seconds to really appeal to them, agitate the problem, um, talk about, a, you know, not a case study, but just here's how we typically help solve that problem. And then call the action, very simple, would it be worth your time? To, to get together yep. and explore this more, right? It's very simple. Um, again, you have to test it, but uh, there's a couple of really good cold callers on LinkedIn that are worth following. Uh, Ryan Reiser, it's one of them. Um, uh, another... That dude is so badass, man. He He's makes... Badass. So if you haven't watched this guy yet, go watch him. Yeah, Ryan's he a makes of all of He's... his sales calls in a race car driver suit. <laughs> he does. Racing yeah. or, uh, Reiser. What's he call himself? Ryan the racer Ryan, or something like that. The racer, yeah. Racer Riser. He um and he and he does a lot of his cold calling via live. So you'll actually get to watch him on LinkedIn live. Um, do cold calls and you can learn from him like on the spot what he's doing. Super talented, very good. He's been doing it. That's how he built his whole business basically when he was running the sales developers, which is kind of a competitor to my old company tribe. But we were friends in the space. We worked with different types of companies, and um his whole thing was just calls. That's all they did. Cold call. They didn't do an email. They didn't do LinkedIn. They didn't do any direct mail. Straight up calls. And it was a volume game. And they used Connect and Sell, the tool, um, to do it at mass. You know? Yep. It was effective, but like anything, high churn. Nonetheless, Ryan's a rock star. Um, I can't think of this guy's name right now. It might come to me, but there's a guy who's he just started cold calling about a year and a half ago and documenting the journey. And um, he's just got a real smooth pitch. His service is lame as shit but his pitch is really tight and uh him setting that first seven second hook is almost automatic it's great no oh, that's awesome it, you made a good point of like the chances of them actually noticing you getting through to the right person it's yeah. it's pretty small like that connect rate i don't even know what industry standard would be um 
I saw the good thing is Ryan used to publish some of the data from his sales developers days. And, and I remember when he, he, I think they did like 500,000 cold calls in one month. And so um, you can kind of see their numbers. And I, if I recall, it could be wrong, but it was like one out of every 23 calls was, they got a connection with a decision. Yeah. And then I think out of that one out of every, maybe like six or seven, they got a conversation and then maybe one out of every 10, they got a meeting out of it. So the numbers are massive. You got to make some dials, but um, they were also not doing a very methodical approach. They were just doing a volume. Sure. And so I think there, there's, there's a good balance. You will have to do more volume naturally. Getting in front of the right person is more challenging um, than it is to get in front of their LinkedIn or a profile because they checked that or their email because they more than likely checked that or an assistant checks that. Um, so data is important too, having the right numbers. Yeah, but then at that point too, you can bake that into a campaign, right? So you can bake mm-hmm. that into your your touch point number one is the cold call, trying to get that 30 seconds of attention. And then even if they don't pick up, you have the leverage to then send them an email saying, hey, just left you a voicemail. You yeah. know, obviously have a script for that voicemail. Um, and then go on and add another five or six steps to that campaign. Yeah, and I think people make the mistake too. Like they might do 30 calls, but if you look at the numbers I just talked about, like you might get one or two connections out of that. And so you don't base your entire strategy around 30 calls. Like you need to get the data and you need to do the reps. And it might be unfruitful, but at least it's data. Data is good data, whether it's pointing to what you thought, it, the, whether it proves your hypothesis or it doesn't. It's still good because you're you're making progress in a direction. For sure. I think that's another. This is the other thing too. A lot of people don't have any sort of process to how they develop their campaigns and how they run their campaigns. And if you don't have process, then the data you're gathering is shitty data. And it's not actually pointing to any helpful decisions moving forward. And so that's why I'm a big fan. Even if something doesn't work, run it to get the reps and get the data back to then make your next more informed decision. Because at first you're shooting in the dark, right? Like for me, I'm shooting in the dark, but I also do this a long time. And I know roughly things that are going to work in a certain direction. I have a good hunch, a good gut uh, instinct on a lot of campaign builds. But even then I'm testing, right? Like I still test to this day, my own stuff. And yep. so I think it's just important. Run those tests, run over and over and over again get the data back and then make your decision from there. No, that's pretty in line too with what you said about, you know, we want to understand the reasons and the things that are calculated into our win rate, but we also want to understand the things that lead to our loss rate in a sales conversation or in a, you know, um, a sales attempt or with a potential deal. Similarly, tracking that with your campaigns, what's winning, but what's losing. Both of those can help you make good decisions. It's great. Yeah, man, it's super important. And so I did, I think like, Try it. Use it as part of your campaign. Like I am a big fan of omni-channel sales. And so people learn different buying behaviors on different channels. They log into LinkedIn to, and they're in a certain decision-making mode versus Facebook versus Instagram versus email versus cold call and you just and, and direct mail. And so you just got to find that rhythm of where you're hitting people. And some people have yeah. assistance for email and cold call, but they don't have assistance checking their LinkedIn. So maybe that's an opportunity. Or maybe they don't have an assistant and they check their emails and that's a huge opportunity. And so um, maybe you get direct numbers and you can, you know, catch someone at a good time and set that meeting for, you know, a 20 minute follow up if you can set the hooks. So the other thing that cold call does that email and LinkedIn other things don't do is it puts a person like your personality can be shown. Whereas personality, unless you're doing a video with email or LinkedIn, your personality can't really be shown through text very well. And so intonation matters. Um, standing yeah. versus sitting matters. The mood you're in matters. And so that can persuade someone. If you have a very trustworthy intonation, you have a, a, a certain type of vibe to you, as weird or as woo as that sounds, like it works. And so if someone's gruff and calling in like, hey, is John there? You know, like <laughs> shit doesn't work. <laughs> but if someone actually has a little bit of like, you know, some sort of friendly intonation to them and, and they see another shit and it just flows off their tongue. Well, that's an opportunity, right? So know thyself to some degree. Know what you're capable yeah, of. Yeah, practice those skills. Going back to Ryan, I'm pretty sure that after every five calls that he makes, he like jumps on the floor and does 20 push-ups or something. I mean, the dude's just like, he's in he a stands. mindset that's, yeah, he stands the whole time. 
he wears his race car driver outfit. He is ready to go. I mean, that's the persona I think you've got to have. Some some kind of persona like that if you're going to win at the phone game. <coughs> 100%. Yeah. You hit on outsourcing some of this or handing some of this off to a sales admin potentially. That's a really good pivot point. So I wanted to talk about hiring a sales admin. You know, maybe the keyword, uh, it's really hot sales enablement. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah. you know, those aren't necessarily synonyms, but... This is, it hits home for where you're at right now because I know you're having a lot of success with this model. Yeah. Let's talk about what the goal of a sales admin is, why you would even hire one. So a mentor of mine, good friend of mine, client of mine, I've basically surrounded myself with him in every possible way. I haven't paid him yet. That's the only thing that, uh, outside of, you know, gestures. Um, he kind of coined the term, maybe someone else has used it since then, but he he's written a couple of books and he talks about this, but... Um, actually, I think Roland Frazier and Ryan Dice stole it from him because they're friends. But right. Vinny Fisher, uh, he's actually coming and talked to the mastermind in August, I believe. Um, nice. But he's kind of coined this this term super employee. Where okay. it's <clears throat> employees, you hire them typically, or at least impact employees have uh, certain skill sets and specialties that uh, make them unique, make them valuable. Um Unfortunately, with every job, there's typically things that they have to do or in qu air quotes have to do in order to do their job holistically, right? And some of those things have far less dollar value than others. And so yeah. like for me, where am I most valuable is in the sales conversation, on the call with the prospect, on the call with the lead, where other things can be delegated for instance, um, would be meeting prep, uh, list building, um, uh, meeting confirmation emails, meeting recap emails, contracts, payments, all those things that are non-revenue generating. Those are $10 an hour, you know, depending on where you can source it from even cheaper, maybe a little bit more expensive in some cases, but Nonetheless, this, this idea of a super employee is giving back valuable time to do valuable things with a particular employee. So like for me, you know, we're changing our model a little bit internally because I, I sure. thrive in sales. I love sales. Unlike most CEOs or most agency owners who are listening, you guys don't come from my background. You guys don't have the same desire as I do. Like I, excuse my crassness, but I, I get a hard on when it comes to sales. You were and sad. So, you were sad when you weren't selling. I, I saw was, it in dude, your I was face. Like depressed. You and were like was, a sad puppy. I've been jacked up months and months and months into this thing and and I'm selling, revenue is better than it's ever been, like all the good things. And all I'm doing is showing up for calls. I'm not doing meeting prep. I'm not doing emails. I'm not doing contracts and payments. I'm not even doing our lead generation necessarily. I'm just giving like a 30 second quality assurance check on the list that we're going after. And then my sales assistant is doing all the, the labor for $10 an hour. And so that is a model that you can, even if that's not the model for you, think about doing that for your salespeople. How, how many people have salespeople and you give your salesperson an assistant? Like very few. And I've been guilty of this too, because you're like, well, the salesperson yeah. did it. It's like, well, at the end of the day, revenue generating activities versus non-revenue generating activities. The statistic is that 65% of people or 65% of a salesperson's time is spent on non-revenue generating activities. What yeah, if you flip that's that? crazy. If the revenue that they generate is only in essentially a 35% of their time window, what happens yeah. if you double their time? Well, you're probably going to double, if not triple or quadruple their output simply because now they're focused on the things that really matter. And so the amount of hours that I spend per week on sales myself, I, one, I love it. So I don't get bogged down by the bullshit. But two, I'm selling hundreds of thousands of dollars of contracts a week right now. Yeah. And it's, and it's effortless. I don't, there's, there's getting your time back, but there's also getting your energy back. And there, we don't think about that. We always think about trading time for money. What about energy? Like, what if something, what if you do something like my sales assistant's on every single call, takes all the notes. He does every, every important thing about the, the prospect, every pain point, every goal. You know, when I benchmark them on pricing, he notates that because we'll need that for later on in the process. Like all that stuff is done by Nick and all I have to do is talk and do my sales thing. And shout out to you, Nick. You're a good person. I like yeah, you. Nick. 
Uh, <laughs> so all that to say, like that is a model where you can create super employees or even help yourself become, a, this isn't even a sales thing. Like this should be for every valuable employee to some degree. Like JJ, you're going to start working with Nick shortly and Nick is going to help you become the mastermind director and, and be an even better mastermind director because you're already kicking ass. And so helping enable you to make you even better, like this should be across the board, not just sales. That's great. Two questions. Yes. One, in your sales cockpit that you spend most of your time in, yes. what is your equivalent of the Ryan Reisert race car driver outfit? Is it like a camo uh, gun t-shirt with a snapback? <laughs> <laughs> it is typically my lines, not sheep. Uh <laughs> desert camo hat that has a rifle on it in American red, white, and blue. It's usually going backwards. <laughs> and I usually have a, a t-shirt on, um, usually a little bit more form-fitting around the, the chest and bias. That's about my only good qualities until like, you get to my legs. And that's all you see above camera. Like right now, you guys are looking at me like, oh, that guy looks pretty fit. If I stood up, you'd see my stomach a little bit. Like, eh, okay, a little squishy. Um, and I usually wear my, my form-fitting, you know, I have one that's also kind of military green, has a big <laughs> red, white, and blue Patriot across the the uh, the chest. But yeah, whatever, to each their own. Uh, I feel like as you're smoking some Marlboro Reds this upcoming weekend, you need to be wearing <laughs> that exact outfit. I will. Cowboy killers. <laughs> that's hilarious. So, Actually, if I smoke cigarettes, I'm only smoking um, American spirits because they're organic and only tobacco. Oh, they've got to be better for you. Then that's great. That's actually hilarious, by the way. Organic <laughs> cigarettes. Oh, so you can get grass-fed cancer. Um, sorry to all you smokers out there. <laughs> it's true. Oh man. So would you consider like somebody who's going to come in and compile those follow-up emails and kind of help move along the sales process, but doing that? I mean, to call it low-dollar, no-dollar work, uh, not non-revenue generating work. Is that the same thing as sales enablement? Because I, I mentioned that on the front end of this question, sales enablement in the space, pretty catchy term. Oh, we need somebody to, to do sales enablement. Is this yeah. the same type of thing or no? Yeah. I mean, listen, there's, so I believe in process people and enablement and enablement somewhat all encompassing of technology stack, um, assets, so things like content, you know, the things that, that, uh, what do you call that? Uh, you used the term earlier, your collateral. Yeah. Collateral, you know, training, like that's all considered enablement. But then I, I do think there's there's kind of that, if you're looking at a Venn diagram, there's an overlap in people and in enablement. And this would be one of those kind of in that middle Venn diagram where you can have these people who are not salespeople, but they are sales assistant. They understand the sales process. And so these are very much administrative type people. They can follow a process. They can they can work within systems. They can troubleshoot problems, like things like that. Um, simultaneously, they also understand the sales conversation that's going on, but they may not be someone who would conduct it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I would probably categorize it. Um, it's definitely it definitely has its place in a sales operation, whether it's a salesperson or a VP of sales or you, a founder who's selling, um, like having these assistants and these admin, I mean, the way that I look at an org chart for like an ideal sales operation would be you have someone at the top who's typically your director of or VP of sales. Yeah, right? their, their job is to lead, coach and manage, right? Lead the team in the direction of where the company's goals are. Uh, coach, help them sharpen the ax, get better at their skill sets, help them work through problems, personal and professional, and then manage, keep them accountable to their goals and the company goals that they're being paid to do. So that's your that's your top of your your um your sales organization specific spe or specifically for an agency right the bigger you get you know SaaS companies and, and these tech companies like you're gonna have a, a much larger org but for most agencies who are listening to this you're probably never gonna have more than two to eight salespeople more than likely um, because of just the size of our deals um, but it should be VP of sales or director of sales at the top underneath them should be your salespeople and so the way that I look at it is. Uh, your salespeople, you can have two or three and you can have an assistant. Like I just mentioned, Nick is my assistant for sales. Nick will also have overlap for JJ in the mastermind. So he can help JJ out, right? An assistant doesn't need to be one per person or per employee. You can have one assistant for two or three salespeople. So I kind of look at like a diamond org chart. Yeah. YouTube sales, 
call it two or three salespeople underneath him, uh, underneath the VP of sales, and then maybe your sales admin, one or two underneath that group of three that's servicing and supporting and enabling those salespeople to be better. And then as you add more salespeople, you can add more admin. I think about, and and we have, you know, we're eight conversations into this. So we've talked about all kinds of things on these Friday conversations, sales on the rocks. So we're, we're down the road on some of these topics, but we started a long time ago talking about how you can't hire anybody without sales process. And so I think where everything you just mentioned kind of fits back into that conversation is so many agency owners want to just go hire a sales rep without any process yep. and tell them to just go do all the things. Well, in addition to them being highly inefficient and ineffective, you're also asking them to go do all this no reven- non-revenue generating work, right? Without one, yep. the, the process to get through it, but two, any kind of enablement or admin underneath them. So imagine what a weight would be lifted off their shoulders. If, that, if that's the trajectory that a lot of our listeners have taken, Yep. Once they bake in some process, but then come and backfill with, hey, this is your sales admin, our sales team of three people. He or she is going to take care of all of this work. And your job is to be prospect facing, you know, to move these deals through our pipeline, to have the conversations, to add value and to close deals. You know, like, yeah, man, that would like be... a, sports, a sports game, right? Like, uh, let's look at basketball. If I asked my best three point shooter to play in the paint, and you know, try to try to go hard. You know, ISO someone and dribble it. Like, or their their best use would be shooting three pointers. And so, what if I said, sure. "Hey, if the three's not open, pass it to this person." Right, that person's good at that thing that you weren't necessarily good yeah. at, and you could focus on threes now. Simultaneously, the the less you have to focus on the stuff that you suck at or that you shouldn't be doing. And the more you get to focus on the reason I said that if you can flip those numbers from 35% of your time being spent on non or revenue generating to now being like 60, 70%, you double your percentage, but you're probably going to more than double the output because they're focused on the things that really matter and they're getting better at it. Like you shoot free throws. If I shot a hundred a day and I make 40 of them or 50 of them or something like that, um, I'm I'm pretty good. I'm okay, right? That's actually not a good percentage, but I'm just using this as a metaphor. If if I then have time to shoot 200 or 300, not to work on the other stuff, yeah, I'm probably not going to get two or three times better. I'm probably going to get exponentially better because I'm only focused on that. Sure, right. And so same thing goes here: is the more they focus on revenue generating activities, the better they they get at revenue generating activities. Yeah, and so they yeah. have double the time, but now they also have two, three, four x the ability. Because they've been sharpening that skill because they have more repetitions at it. Yeah. And I to dive into that analogy with you, I think it's even more like because all five players in the four floor are extremely valuable and they're all executing revenue generating activities, right? Yeah. So it'd be more like asking the guy who plays in the paint and your sharpshooter to handle like trip logistics and their diet and their exercise plan yeah. and where you know housing and all these things, scheduling. It's like no, don't. You hire somebody to go do all that, all that stuff. The stuff that the the six eight power forward can't do and shouldn't do, and right. then you go tell your power forward to dunk on people and practice that, or your sharpshooter to shoot. And it all um, and it adds up all that non revenue. I mean, the stuff you don't even think about. Your salespeople are doing right. What happens when someone yeah reschedules a meeting? Well, then you got to look at your calendar. Then you got to line up with their calendar. Yeah. Then you got to move the calendar invite and get the confirmation. Then you got to send another meeting confirmation email. If you didn't, even, if you did one the first time, you got to send another one. If you didn't do it, well, you still need to send a meeting confirmation because what what happens when your rep shows up for a call, stops what they're doing, shows up for a sales call, never got confirmed, never sent the meeting confirmation, and no, someone no shows. Well, they just wasted ten minutes waiting on a call and doing nothing. That's all non revenue yeah. generating. What if all they did was show up for calls that are confirmed? Or yeah. or some variation of that. Yeah, that's a that's a totally different thing. That's really good. Okay, I love that. Uh, thanks for diving into that. I want to talk a little bit more about sales team models because I have a couple specific questions. But before we do, I want to talk about the mastermind. Not just the mastermind, but if you're watching YouTube, you can see the acronym up top. The best damn agency mastermind. Does it take a little bit of confidence to say that we're the best damn anything? One hundred percent. But I I believe it. That we we truly are in the agency space. There is no one doing what we're doing 
high seven or eight figure agencies who are obsessed with growth, who are building the, the their dream agencies that they want to run uh, and who are cool as shit. That's kind of the bottom line. That's what we're building. We have a community of people just like that. If that describes you, you should be hanging out with us. Um, we have a lot of really, really cool stuff happening. I just talked to a guy today who uh, has been working with us, working with us for sixty days, and has done I think five hundred k in ARR in the last sixty days. A lot of that is attributed to the work he's doing in the mastermind with this awesome group of agency owners. So, if you want to close more deals, if you want to solve problems alongside of an elite group of agency owners with us. You could shoot me an email, jj at salesdrivenagency.com, or you could check out the website, bestdammastermind.com. Joey and I would love to talk to you. Boom. Yeah, and, and Boom. I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. It's your, it's your ad spot, but I'm going to add to it. I think, listen, if you're in that position where you're doing seven figures and you are either in that transition period of becoming a CEO as opposed to being some of the day to day, or you've already made that transition and you're, you're dealing with a lot of other, we have, we have some agencies, one in particular, who's got a hundred employees who has basically a managing director for all directors and all these things. Like if once you get to a certain point, the problems don't go away, they just magnify and then multiply. And so for you to have a community of people that you can pour into and that's going to pour into you back or pour back into you, is tremendous. I mean, a lot of these people we're talking about, it is win after win after win in the mastermind because yep. they're connecting. Like, listen, I get that people come because they know my brand. They know that they're going to get world-class sales exposure for agencies. That's why they come. Why do they stay? Has nothing to do with me. Yeah, they like me. They like you. But they stay because of the the bonds that they that they forge with these other agency owners. And they get in these relationships that are, that are this bi-directional value going back and forth, people helping each other, being selfless, and they're cutting corners because they're learning from people who've already solved the problem you're trying to solve. That's what you pay yeah. for. You're going to get ROI like that. I yeah. mean, these people, yeah. I mean, this person you just mentioned that I talked to this morning, you talked to, 500 grand the past month or so. They've only been in it for 60 days. They're attributing a lot of it to the things they're learning from, even just from a confidence perspective. He said he's more confident yep. in his sales conversations simply because of the conversations we're having in the group. And the other thing is he's realizing like all these really successful agency owners, you look around and you're like, oh, I'm not the most broken one. I'm not the only one who has broken things. I'm not the only one that has problems. And so there's yeah. comfort in that. There's also confidence, right? Because other people are solving it. They're walking through it. So the ROI is there from a money perspective, but there's things in there that are so intangible and so invaluable. You can't find anywhere else. So why are the fucking best damn agency mastermind? That, Cups you just up, added baby. an extra four letter word we should rebrand <laughs> the fucking damn best <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so hey what's cool is um i i can't sell anything that i don't believe in that's just the way yeah, that i work me either but i can sell if i really believe in something i can sell it yep. and i talked to a guy who was considering joining the mastermind i have a follow-up call with him later this week and his thing was, man, I've thought about joining a lot of these. And what's always clear to me is the people running them, you know, the CEO, whoever it is that put them together, they care a lot about them. But typically the other members in the group like aren't that involved or they're just there to get their own questions answered. Yep. And my fear would be that this would be another one of those things. And so, man, I, I was so proud to tell him like, hey, that's the opposite of what we've built. Like if you're that person who's going to leech in the group, who's not going to contribute, who's not going to be a giver, who doesn't believe in the the law of reciprocity, like we're not going to let you in. No. Um, and then and I was able the to point to our Slack for. channel. Good. That's the other thing you're paying for. You are paying for mine and JJ's ability to go source the most legit agency owners that you get to be around. That you can't find another group like it that has the quality people that are in your industry yeah. that are solving your problems. We're doing the hard work. That's why you pay us to go find those people, to vet them, to ensure that they're the best damn agencies that belong in this mastermind. So if you get in, you just realize the vetting process you went through is the same one that everyone else went through. And if, if you got through and it was hard and they got through and it's hard, we got a pretty damn good group. No, that's true. That's it. I uh, hope you guys shoot me an email. I want to talk to you. Yep. Let's go back into this sales team structure conversation. This one, this question or the topic I want to talk about, it's a little bit more niche 
but I'm sure that there's a lot of agency owners out there who either have had this question and don't know how to answer it, or they've never asked this question and maybe they should. So when you're talking about building out your sales team, there's a couple of different ways to do it. The most common one in this space with kind of you know smaller teams is either you go hire, well, you could outsource. We've told you that's not the best solution typically, um, but you go hire some full cycle salespeople and then you support them with the admins that we were just mm-hmm. talking about, or you go more the SDR account executive model yep. and they play, you know, they play ball together. Um, yep. Let's talk a little bit about why, like what those models are, why people choose them. And then if there's one that you think is a clear cut favorite. Yeah. For agencies in, I'll call it 90% of the circumstances, I believe more in the full cycle salesperson. Version two of that is full cycle salesperson with an assistant. Um, The reason being because our sales are very delicate, they are complex, a lot of custom things that go into it. And it requires a lot of trust because of how expensive they are. It's important to have that continuity throughout the whole sales process of somebody who is is with you from interested slash becoming aware to decision. Whereas in the SDR account executive role, it's it's a very that's a very SaaS centric. For the people who don't know what that means, SDR sales development rep. Uh, AE account executive, right? So it's typically looked at like a hunter and gatherer in a lot yeah. of ways or, or, or yep. sorcerer and, and closer, right? So uh, SDR is more like doing the preliminary stuff, the qualifying, getting on the calendar, the account executive. Account executive is helping you kind of custom uh, think through if this is the right decision for you, help you, you know, show off some of the features, or whatever, and then close you on the deal. Um, that works in a SaaS model because it's lower transaction value. Um, it's also typically SaaS is investing a lot more into marketing dollars and they're getting a lot of leads and those leads need to be sourced. And so I wouldn't want a full cycle salesperson sitting on a call with 15, 20 people a day and 15 or 12 of them are unqualified. If sure. you're getting a ton of leads, ton of leads, I mean like hundreds of leads, per month inbound, I think it could make sense to have some sort of SDR model, right? Because you've got a little bit of trust built in enough for them to convert um, into you know, that first call. You can have an SDR or a BDR kind of on the on the front end doing a lot of the qualifying and putting it on the call with kind of the senior person or the closer. That yep. model can work. High lead volume that's inbound works great. Um, if you're doing mostly outbound or at least a blended model, and super high transaction value. I just think that it's important to have that continuity throughout the whole process. So I think that's the reason I love for agencies. I'd have a different answer for SaaS or some other more uh, transactional or commoditized model. But in agency space, that full cycle salesperson is pretty important. Let me push back on that a little bit because I feel like the rebuttal or the reason that a lot of agencies want to go towards that SDR, BDR account executive model is because of how consultative the sale is, because of how complex the sale is, they don't foresee a world where they could go hire somebody and out the gate, give that person the responsibility of walking prospects through the entire sales process. They would rather go find, you know, one or two AEs who are they're more tenured, they're more experienced, they know the market, they know the product, they know all the things, and then hire somebody to do that, you know, the the low dollar or the easier job of just like sending emails, doing work. outreach. Yeah, the grunt work. Um, wh- so you're convinced though that uh, that you could train somebody up to be a full cycle salesperson in the marketing space, digital marketing space. Yeah, I mean, I did it with you. You know, and you know, you're not still in that role because <laughs> we found a better role for you, but you were still good at it. And and I think it does come down to offer structure messaging. It comes down to product market training. It comes down to potentially from an offer structure perspective, do you have some sort of stepping ladder of sell something easier, leads them to selling something more expensive on the back end, right? Like I think that there is that model um, or th- there is that that approach where you can have the foot in the door offer. We've mentioned that on previous Uh, episodes before like those are all ways that you can kind of start getting the feet wet right and and, yeah i I can't remember which episode it was but i think you talked about 
there's a lot of benefits in like, obviously we did product, product market training, like understanding our market, mm -hmm. understanding the product and how it fits in our market, the problems we solve, the goals we help people achieve, et cetera. That's important, but it, you learn from doing. And, and even more than that, if you have like a foot in the door offer where it's like an audit or a blueprint or a roadmap, yeah, you start learning even more about the product or market by selling that thing. And then the team who knows sure. their shit does the work and then they produce the roadmap, blueprint, audit, whatever salesperson gets to know the product and market even faster and better by looking at a real life example and then they yep. go sell the bigger engagement based off of that. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, I think that if you follow our methodology at sales driven agency, you can be, you can turn a good salesperson into a full cycle salesperson. I don't think you need that SDRAE model. Um, yeah. I mean, but like to each their own, right? You guys can, there's not there's there's many ways to build a sales team or a sales culture or a sales operation. I happen to think mine's the best for agencies. I'm not saying that for all spaces. Yeah. Um because we don't lose typically when we get a client who pays us a lot of money to come solve that problem for them. Sure. Um, yeah, totally. Whereas there's a bunch of failure out there in the market right now, people trying to figure it out themselves. And so you can keep going on that route. And I don't disagree with the pushback. I think that you can have that SDRAE model. I just think that your numbers might look different and it's yeah. more complex and you're going to lose trust between your first conversation and your second because it's two different people. I, I trust this guy yeah. first to take the next call. I don't know this guy yet. So now I'm talking to him and I got to, you know, so tomato, tomato, but there's I, a, maybe a hybrid of that. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this too. I was listening to a podcast and I've seen, I've read some articles recently where everybody's talking about team selling, right? So, and again, I think that's a, a byproduct of the consultative sales approach where these deals are complex, but team selling, and, and I'll take your definition for it, but as I understand it, where you have, you know, the salesperson who's kind of the primary initial point of contact, and then throughout the sales process, they're bringing other people into the conversation as it makes sense. Typically, Expert. you know, it's going to be a, yeah, an expert or a uh, a designer or a, a project manager, or, yeah, strategist, whoever it is, and then finally maybe even bringing on an executive or a director on the closing call to be a part of that call too. Yeah. Um, what's your thought on that approach to all of this? You're doing free work. <laughs> like, okay. That, that, I mean, that's and, and that's fine. Like, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I just think that oftentimes you're going to pull a strategist in who's probably a hundred dollar an hour person to a sales conversation that may or may not turn into something. And so yeah, yeah. I'm going to utilize those very valuable people again, revenue generating versus non-revenue generating. Um, if I'm going to use those very valuable people, I don't want to use them on, let's just say it takes, let's just use an industry standard uh, or a low, you know, a low conservative 10% close rate. If I need to bring a strategist in on 10, 30 minute calls, that's five hours. That's $500 that I spent to close the deal. Now, is that, do the numbers still work out? Sure. Like, yes, $500 and you charge $50,000, $100,000 for your service. It's, that, that works out. But then their bandwidth is also smaller. So they've got five hours yep. with this salesperson over here and they've got 35 hours left to do their job. And so I think that's fine. I'd, I'd much rather get paid to do that kind of scoping and strategy work and things like that. And so that's why I always will suggest a foot in the door offer of some sort that you get paid to essentially do more elaborate proposals that are dialed in and those kind of things. But um, yeah. it still works. You know, like that's the beauty of, of this game is there's not just one way to win it. And so I think if what you're doing is, is working, uh, I might argue there's a better way of doing it, but I'm not going to tell you to stop doing something that's working. But I would but you say can give it a beta working, test. Give it a shot. Give it a test. Yeah. I think it's super yeah. important to always be testing because the market's always changing and business models are always evolving. I mean, we're seeing that the mastermind with, I mean, even the way agencies are starting to run far more profitably and far more efficiently and still get the same or better results for the clients. Like if yep. you keep running the traditional agency model, you might be losing out on a bunch of that profit margin and efficiency that some other people who are ahead of you are figuring it out. Another plug for the mastermind, yeah. but uh, that's also a case for, be testing new things always. Like don't get don't get romantic about how you do things, how you make money, how you deliver your services, how you do anything. The moment you do that, that's why I hate productized service companies. At the end of the day, if it's productized, it's eventually going to get old or saturated or less effective. There's an algorithm change, there's a regulation yeah. change, whatever, and you get 
complacent and well, then all your clients suffer. And that's the yeah. hard thing about this is why agencies have a hard time building trust is because we get paid whether you suffer or you don't. And that's an unfortunate model. It's the reality we live in. Um, but if you're not always evolving your model, if you're not always evolving what you do, if you're not always evolving your sales process, you're probably missing out on a lot and you might be hurting more than just your business. I once heard it said by the Andy Stanley. Shout out to the Andy Stanley Leadership Podcast. You should check mm -hmm. it out if you haven't. But he said oh. he likes to say, um, married to the mission, dating the model. So mm -hmm. it applies maybe more spot on to like churches or missionally minded organizations. But I think, you know, we've talked about having a a why that's bigger than just the dollar signs or the commas. And so I think that that probably applies here too on a broader scale of like, yeah, be married to the why you're doing it and what you want to accomplish and and but maybe how you're going to get there or some of the tactics along the way, like, you know, don't be so rigid. Yeah. Be willing to learn. Yeah. And I think so, that that romanticizing is what gets a lot of people in trouble. It's why. Yeah. I mean, we've all heard it. The Netflix versus the blockbusters of the world, like they got romantic about their model. They laughed at Netflix's model. Well, who's laughing now? Right. And that happens in, in our everyday life, too, whether we want to admit it or not. Agency world's ever evolving. Technology's ever evolving. Our clients and market are ever evolving. And so we have to stay on top of that. Um, and I know we're focused on sales here, but that's just a business principle I think we can all take into account. No, that's great. That's great. Um, okay. A couple interesting questions to wrap this thing up here. Uh, one, sales-ish focused. Two, personal. If you want to hear the personal question I'm going to ask Joey, you should hang around. That's right. So yeah, the, the first one is like, I have found myself as somebody who listens to you every day, who has heard kind of the A to Z of solid sales process, sales strategy for agencies, or, or just really period. Like any conversation that I'm on where I'm on the other side of the sales conversation, somebody is selling me something, hmm. dude, I am so critical. Like I am. <laughs> and so I would imagine as somebody who's only been in this space for you know a year, uh, that for you, who's been living, breathing, doing this for 10 years, like, can you even take a call from like a an AT and T or a pest control company oh, or like or somebody trying to somebody trying to sell your company something? Like, what is it like yeah. for you to be on the other side of a sales conversation? Well, I think I mentioned this before. If someone ever cold calls me and they're like a legit business, it's not like some Indian based company who scra scrape my information offline and trying to sell me some bullshit sure. website design, right? But if someone like picks up the phone from a software company or the service company, they call me, I will give them 60 seconds. Yep. I'm not going to hang up on them because it took balls to do that or vaginas. If it's a girl, I don't know if that equates to <laughs> having cojones, but I don't want to, I don't want to count anyone out. Uh, but it, it takes, it takes a lot of guts to pick that up. So I will take that call now. First time appointment. Mm, um, it takes a lot these days for me to give up 20 minutes of time. That's to be money both in time and potentially have to spend money on something. So I try to do a little bit more due diligence before and I'll grill someone before I actually take that meeting um, or yeah. I'll go seek them out. And so I don't think I have run into a few circumstances where I was really impressed with the salesperson and I wanted to offer them a job. Didn't need them, but I liked them a lot. A few circumstances where that was really, really, I, I'd probably count it on one hand. Just amazing. Yeah. The rest of them, I, I'm, I'm like you. I'm very critical. I'm also empathetic. You know, not everybody has training like we give, and not everyone has that experience. But um, I am very aware of people's deficiencies because of my, which is somewhat of a. It's probably hurt me. I've probably been turned off the products I probably could have bought and benefited from just simply by the salesperson. I feel like the most important part of this is the fact that it feels really acceptable for you to say balls on this podcast, but really cringy for you to say vaginas. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, lady. <laughs> like, no, I'm just saying like, yes, sorry. I'm sure there's an apology owed in there somewhere, but I don't get why, why, why I don't apologize but, for shit. But what I'm saying is why, <laughs> why is one acceptable? And you did apologize, by the way. Why I? is one? Sorry, yeah, you said, sorry, ladies. Why is one acceptable and the other's not? Uh, just years of standards. desensitization of the year yeah, of the cultural, word balls. cultural standards. Um, yeah, I've got plenty of opinions on the matter. We probably shouldn't go that route. We should probably move on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we'll have like last episode where I had to tell my editor to edit something out that I said, <laughs> which I rarely do. 
That's the first yeah. time I've actually had him do something. I promise it, uh, it was worth it. To those of you wondering what it was, we're not even going to go there. So, <laughs> uh, no. The, so the reason that this even pops into my head is the question of do you assess salespeople on the other side of the call? I was on. I've been on multiple calls this week. We're bidding out this video production job for the yeah. mastermind. And dude, I have been so critical. Like I'm, I'm super nice in the call. I'm, I am a bubbly person. People make fun of the fact that I like, I laugh on most of the calls we're on. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Redding over at DP Marketing, I think, made fun of me for for giggling on one of our calls. <laughs> JJ the giggler. Uh, JJ the giggler. Yeah, but so I'm having fun. But the whole time, man, I literally this this is what went through my head. I I wrote these down. They had great assets like sales assets because they're marketers, right? Like, right. of course, they're going to have amazing portfolios and case studies and those things. They did, a, they did a, a decent job of asking me questions. So all three of these companies asked me questions. Hey, what do you want? What are you, what are you hoping to get? Um, zero of them took like any of the value-based pricing um, principles like into, into play. Like they, none of them told me about the impact the video would have. None of them talked about how quickly I'd recoup my investment, what I stood to lose or make if I didn't work with them or if I did. It was all about like, this is kind of the industry standard. And so when they were ballparking me at, you know, 15 or 20 grand for this video package, right? I, I started to think about how all of our prospects and probably yours, if you're listening, all I'm thinking about is, man, like that's a lot of free money, money out versus money in. All I stand to lose. And, you know, the reality is you and I talked about this this morning. If we, if we sell one additional deal, on the back end of this video that's that came in because of this video, we recoup our entire investment. Yeah. And so, man, if they had gone that route with like, what, what kind of money do you stand to make and really pitch the value of the video? You know, are you going to lose out if you go with a tier three video production agency? Yep. Right. Or is your brand going to suffer? Those kind of things. Like if we'd started to talk about the value they can add, that would have been a huge deal. Um, the other thing too, is like, I found myself and you probably do too. I took control of every call I was on. Mm. So we talk about as the challenge the, as the buyer. As the buyer, I literally was leading the entire freaking call. I told them about my budget. I told, I mean, I was telling them about what we wanted, what we needed, our pain points, our problems, our objectives. Like I was just telling them everything. And I probably should have shut my freaking mouth and just sat there. <laughs> But I had to tell them because none of them asked me. So I, right. I was waiting and waiting and waiting the, and waiting. They are and waiting. order taker and, salespeople. And finally, I was like, hey, do y'all want to know like what I want in this video and you know what, what objectives we're trying to overcome here and like what my budget is that they weren't going to yeah. ask me. And that's why um, the guy who I think we're going to go with eventually will we'll make that decision soon. But one thing he did was he asked what, an av- what, a, what a member's worth to me for the mastermind. Oh, that's sick. I like that. And I was like, well, is this much? And he's like, well, this pays for that if you get one extra, yeah. right? Like, and, the Dude, and that was a 10 second conversation. Like, how easy was that for him to it's say? So easy. And, and it, when he did that, my mind went from how much money would go out to how much money is going to come in. And he gave me that option to think that way. Whereas if you're yeah. just talking about the deliverables of, I'm going to give you this many videos and this long, and I can do this many hours and have this many people there, it'll cost you this much money. Well, I'm only thinking about the money. I'm not thinking about the impact it's going to have on my business because you haven't given me that option. You haven't helped. Uh, you haven't ushered me because I don't know shit about video, to be honest. Like, yeah, press record and I can do some, you know, random shit on Ecamm Live to make pull this <laughs> podcast off. But that's about as good as it gets. It's so here. average. <laughs> yeah. So average at best. And so uh, if you can help me paint the picture of what is this deliverable, what is the strategy relate to in terms of revenue back to me and you help me think, oh, you're right. If this did land me one extra mastermind member per month. Like my ROI is 12, 15, 20 X what I'm going to spend on this video. Those are the kind of things I want to focus on instead of getting so cheap and tight and close to my wallet because I'm like, "Mm, it's a lot of money. You know, like that to me gets me more excited about, Oh, this guy gets, this is, this is a business decision. You're not order taking. Yeah. And we've talked about that. We've talked about value-based pricing. I just thought that it was really interesting to see play out in a real world scenario, being on the other end. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other thing, the last thing I'll say is not a single person booked a follow-up meeting on the call. So I even had, of the three, I had one agency say, would you like to do a follow-up? There was no assumption in there either. It was like, would you like to follow up with us? Like, uh, yeah. I mean, I'd I'd like to get a proposal and then let's follow up. And then... 
I told her on the call, I literally said, Hey, nobody has actually booked the meeting on the call before. Like, this is great. And she kind of smiled. And then she said, yeah, I'll email you some potential times. I was like, fuck, you You almost passed. And then you, and then you failed right at the last second. So I don't know, man, if you're, if you're not sitting down with, if you're an owner who is still the sales leader and you have salespeople, like sit down with them, watch their calls, evaluate those calls with them during your follow-ups, during your meetings. I mean, they might not be doing some of these really simple things that would make them exponentially better at their job. It does. I mean, even, um, I mean, I talked to two mastermind members this morning because they had their 60 day strategy, strategy calls with me. And one of them had the 500K growth out of nowhere. And he was basically making zero every month because he was stagnant. And they're a, you know, a decent size, five, $6 million agency. I think they lost a big client earlier this year. And so now they're yeah, yeah. fighting to get deals back. And now they're you know landed 500 in contracts in one or two months. Um, and one thing that he had said to me was, I'm just so grateful I met you guys because you taught me a lot of the small things. And then the call before that was with Chris, um, a different agency owner. Also, I was like, man, I have noticed a different level of confidence and leverage in a sales conversation just by implementing the process of yeah. setting the call, having the expectation of this is what this is going to look like, keeping control, like you mentioned, and 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 leading them through the sales process as opposed to being an order taker and just kind of going with the flow and seeing where it goes. Yep. So I think it's just a huge testimony. Like even the small things, and some of you don't know what the small things are, and that's okay. I'd encourage you to go figure it out. Um, keep listening to us. You know, feel free to pay us, whatever. But nonetheless, those small things make a huge difference when you add them up. It's the incremental improvements that inc- that create that exponential growth. Yeah. No, that's good. Yeah, it's great. I think it's it's also a a reason to advocate for role playing. Yeah. So again, if you're a founder, you don't have a ton of time. But what might be more important than anything to your sales reps is that you sit down with them if you have not in a while and you get on a role-playing sales call where you get to hear what they actually say, the kind of, you know, what their process actually is, what their script actually is, those kind of things. So yeah, I don't know, super important. All right, the personal questions coming your way, Joey. So I know that you, as many I have seen uh, of my LinkedIn connections have done, you opted in for this 75 hard challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, you can look it up. Uh, the guy's name, I think, is Andy something. Andy, Andy Frisella. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to give him credit, but he's got this challenge where you basically like become a robot for 75 days and you work out twice and you read a book every day and you eat don't nothing drink but alcohol vegetables. Like I did and, today. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So my question is, as as your friend, as somebody who wants to like hold you to these things, how are you doing? I'm going to ask you on the air as you take I'm a sip fucked, of your... Dude. <laughs> Uh, I'm working out good. I'm doing more cardio. My diet's terrible. Okay. Uh, date nights. So we're going on a double date tonight with another couple, and I'm probably very nice going to chips and queso. Unfortunately. Oh, not good. Not good. Not good. And they have really good cocktails, and I'm really into tequila right now. And it's a it's like a high end taqueria, and they have mm. like super nice añejo tequila there. So you know, um, not great. Thanks for the accountability, um, but it's not going. Feel good. free I to am ask me weight. about getting stronger. <laughs> All those things are happening, but uh, I'm not sticking to it. I'm educating myself. I'm sticking to a plan. I'm working out. I'm not drinking a whole lot of alcohol, which is good, except for on Tuesdays and maybe once on the weekend. And then the diets. The diets all. I'm a, I'm a serious food addict, and I don't mind saying that because I think a lot of people don't are. You, and they won't make I thought you in, don't you intermittent fast? Should be yes. Okay, but so, well, the hard part is it. if I intermittent fast without a plan. So if I intermittent fast for, you know, I do a 16 hour fast, with an eight hour feeding window. If I intermittent fast for 16 hours and I don't have a plan for what I'm going to eat in eight hours, you boys in trouble. <laughs> you just <laughs> eat everything. <laughs> well, I just don't have a plan. I don't, you know, I go in, I'm like, fuck, I'm hungry. Uh, I'm going to do this protein shake and I'm still hungry. So I'm going to jump in, I'm going to eat this protein bar. And then next thing you know, I'm, I'm crushing the calories and not really paying attention to them. And then like I blew my 16 hour f- fast by, you know, shoving my face into eight hours for eight hours. So although it feels like I'm shitting all over you, I'm still, I'm proud of you for even trying. So right Thank now you. I've got a, I've got a six week old. I have not worked out in two months. I'm eating whatever the hell I want. I think I'm drinking six days a week. Like 
I am just not a healthy human being right now. Uh, so if you happen to be like a fitness guru who's listening to this and uh, you want to, I don't know, get a free case study or something, um, I can look really fit if you want to put in the time. Can, in the I, just got, get, I just got one of those freak, freak phenom bodies if, if he shaped it. Yeah, right now it's shaped like a corn dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least it's not a pear like me. It feels. Oh like it man! All right. Well, hey, I as always, this is like my favorite time of the week. Enjoyed talking to you. We talked about a lot of things. Some of it was sales related, uh, but that's the point of us drinking some bourbon and having a fun conversation. Is the conversation just gets better as we keep going? So. Now I want a corn dog. <laughs> <laughs> You should go get one. So if you're listening and you want to talk to Joey about corn dogs or sales, I'm going to throw his email out there. Uh, you can email him that. at, at <laughs> JJ <laughs> at sales driven agency. I'm just kidding. You guys can email me. My assistant's going to vet you probably and just throw it out. So Joey at sales driven agency.com. Yeah. Good yeah. luck. If, if it's a lead, I'll let my assistant deal with you, but or just go to the website and book a call. Yeah, book it. That's easier. Go to salesdrivenagency.com, book a call. You can find all of our fun stuff there. Uh, and if you're interested in the mastermind, you can email me because I'm a nice person. JJ at salesdrivenagency.com uh, or bestdammastermind.com because it is the best damn mastermind. Yes. So this is another installment of the Sales in the Rocks podcast. You can find us here every Friday. I think it's well documented. We film on Tuesdays. It's a fun excuse for me to drink on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we love you guys. We're thankful that you listen. Subscribe. Leave us a comment. Leave us a rating. If you leave me a comment and you ask me a really good sales related question, I'm gonna we'll ask it on the podcast. So that'd be something that'd be fun Ooh, to start let's too. Do this. Uh, let's do let's do something fun. Okay, good. Good. If you subscribe, nobody's listening right now. <laughs> If you, We're like on. 55 minutes in. <laughs> we'll do a giveaway. We'll do a cool giveaway. Okay. If you subscribe okay. and you get, let's do this. We just start our YouTube channel. So whether you're watching yeah. on YouTube now or you're listening on Spotify or Apple or whatever, go to our YouTube channel. It's, I think it's Joey Yilke dash sales driven agency. Um, or just go to, uh, you know what, just go there. If you go there and you subscribe, take a picture that you subscribed and then I want you to comment on this uh, video specifically. Anything. I don't care what you comment. It could be it could be some straight up fuckery. I don't care. But I want to get some engagement going because I'm trying to... Literally, I think we have like less than 20 subscribers because we just launched the YouTube. We just started. Yeah. 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 And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at people who comment and subscribers. And if you take a screenshot and send it to JJ's email... We'll put you in for a drawing. And when we hit a thousand subscribers, which we're going to hit fast because we'll start putting some ads behind this, I'm going to, I haven't decided yet, but I'm going to do something pretty impressive. I might buy you, I'm going to, one, I'll buy you my favorite bottle of bourbon and send it to you. And I'll do a free, this is an expensive thing. I will do two hours of consulting for free with you, which I don't offer. Oh, gosh. Okay. That's all right. The bourbon, I'm pretty sure it's E.H. Taylor. Am I right? Yeah, it's like 120 bucks. Uh, I think you can find it for 80 at Total Wine. So that's still, that's nice. Okay. But the consulting, that's a four-figure offer. So mm -hmm. you should do that. Yep. So I'm look, I'll be on the lookout for anything that hits my inbox. Screenshot, if I've got a picture of subscribe. your subscribing, then you are in a drawing to win a thousand plus dollar consulting deal with Joey and a free bottle of bourbon. So Boom. that's a win. All right, cup. Joey. I'll see you here next Friday, bro. This is always fun. Enjoy Peace, it. Peace, Blair. See you. Later.